Right. And hello, good evening everybody. Uh, we're at the GDG Cloud Meetup today. Uh, my name is Demi and this is Matthew from Google. Uh, Jonathan will be joining us soon. Uh, we'll have two sessions today. One is about uh, Google's cloud security and in general the security measurements and all the road that they're taking in the matter of cybersecurity in the cloud. And the other will be the tool set of the data analytics on Google Cloud by Jonathan at Google in the Cloud Architect too. Uh, how many of you actually know GDG Cloud as a community? Awesome. So I'll tell you a bit. Uh, we're handling in the manners of uh, cloud service providers in general. Any use cases that you would like to talk or give talks uh, in the manner of cloud, cloud service providers, Kubernetes, and everything by the technologies, you are more than welcome to actually approach me afterwards and uh, suggest talks. And uh, even if things interest you and you want to incorporate uh, things that you want to know about, I can actually help you out to search for like good talks by people. So you're more than welcome to actually approach and ask. So you're welcome and thank you very much for coming. Oh, my pleasure. I was really looking forward for your talk. So here. Good evening. So thank you for your time. I appreciate I appreciate everybody showing up. Uh, my name's uh, Matthew O'Connor. Um, I'm uh, part of Google's cloud office and CTO. I'm based in well now Sunnyvale, California, but uh, because Google in Northern California has outgrown our headquarters location in Mountain View, and we started to spill into the next town over. Um, and I was I uh, I was invited to speak at the CyberTech conference yesterday. So that's what brought me to town, and then I got introduced to Demi and asked to come to do this. Um, so um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, what I plan to do is I plan to uh, basically give the same talk that I gave yesterday uh, at CyberTech. Um, I don't know if any of you were there. Um, I won't speak quite as fast because I have a little bit more time. And what I would like to do is I would like to, I would like you to ask questions if you have questions because I think it'll be more interesting if it's interactive. And I didn't do that yesterday. There just wasn't time for that. Um, and uh, so, just to help orient myself, how many of you have developed an application or a service on Google Cloud? How many of you have read the documentation? How many of you, uh, if you haven't uh, done an application, um, are you planning to, or are you just curious? Just curious, or planning to? Okay, okay. Well, good. That helps me, and the and the reason that I was asking that question is because a lot of times, sometimes I have to assume that my audience doesn't know anything about Google Cloud, and since <laughs> most of you raised your hands, I feel like I'm in a little bit better shape. I do have to give you a little bit of background on how we got to Google Cloud, and I think you'll find this interesting. So most of you, well, since you're cloud developers, you know about Google Cloud. But most of the world knows us as a search and advertising company. But the interesting thing about it, and Google will be, uh, is almost 20 years old, but the interesting thing is, is that over the course of those 20 years, we've built seven cloud products that have over a billion users, and that's uh, led to having to solve some really interesting problems at scale. And security is one of those problems. Um, in supporting those seven businesses and our emerging businesses, we believe that we've built the largest and most advanced computing infrastructure. Now let me give you a few statistics to support that. Um, over the past several years, we've made almost a $30 billion investment in our infrastructure. This is capital outlays. This is building building data centers. This is laying networks. Um, this is some of this is pulling undersea cables. Um, we serve uh, over a billion unique IP addresses on a daily basis. Uh, we continue to add uh, service regions to um, to our infrastructure to better serve the customers in their local markets. And one of our design criteria is very high reliability um, because Google can't break. It's, it's important to people. It's, uh, it's become a verb and it's what people do. You don't actually search for information, you Google it. Um, it's a verb. Exactly. Um, this is our global network um, and the infrastructure that powers all the services that you can develop against live on this network. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, 
Um, the, the, one of the most interesting things are the blue dots here, which show the edges of the network. And if you were to, if you were to, if you were to post a map of the population of the world and did it with circles, it would look a lot like this map um, because this, we follow the customers. And so the customers that are consuming the services, we, we make the network available to them. And this is how we can make sure that YouTube videos on mobile phones work as well in Tel Aviv as they do in New York City, as they do in Malaysia. And so Google's cloud is, is, our, is, is bringing Google services and, and our infrastructure to our customers so that our customers can build applications and services at the scale at which Google builds them. <coughs> um, interestingly enough, you, you may or may not know this, but um, uh, Spotify runs on Google's infrastructure. And they, they was, you know, it was some app developers that started to build this app and it became very successful. And it's a Snapchat, no? Yes. Yes. That's right. It's actually Snapchat. Snapchat is bigger than... Yeah. <laughs> um, and so they, uh, they, we've been able to enable them to grow at a rate that they wouldn't have been able to do five years ago or ten years ago. One of the things that we've learned over building this infrastructure and delivering these services is that a traditional approach to security, um, IT security, doesn't work at scale. Um, and what I mean by this is a strong network perimeter, lots of firewalls, bastion hosts, and then uh, fairly open networks to provide services inside. Common attack is break through the, break through the wall and then once you're on the network, you can move around the network. So that's been a big, uh, big part of our thinking in terms of, of how we, we think about securing what we do. So we have some fundamental principles, um, and one of the things that's, that's, kind of, uh, that's kind of interesting that we do at Google, and I think is a little bit unique, is because security is important to us, we train all employees on security. Um, and so when you're, when you're a brand new employee at Google, you're called a Noogler. And as part of your Noogler training, your indoctrination to Google, um, one of the classes that you take was some training around privacy and security. Um, and then on a regular basis, we refresh that. Um, and in some situations, if, you're, if your job at Google demands more uh, in those areas, the training will be tailored to meet your job function. But all Google employees, uh, regardless of what they're doing, get basic security training. And the biggest thing that we're trying to do in that situation is we're trying to increase awareness. And then the other thing is, is that when you have awareness and you have buy-in, it has positive effects on your culture. So in a lot of enterprise situations, when the security guys show up, that's not a good thing. They're usually, and maybe some of you are enterprise developers and you have the situation where you're getting ready to launch your product, and the security guy's like, you can't do it because it, it doesn't meet our requirements. <coughs> well, we don't, we don't operate that way. We make sure that everybody understands the requirements when they start developing a piece of software. And the security engineering team acts as a consultant and helps, helps our developers do what they need to do and do it <coughs> in the proper way and keep them up to date. Uh, we spend, uh, I've already talked about the investment we make. Um, our core infrastructure and services are built around a secure foundation. And like I was explaining the situation on how we think about training people on security, we design and build and operate with security in mind. It's a key principle for us. We also believe control and visibility is really important to be able to um, keep things secure, know what's going on. If you fall into regulatory requirements or you have certain, uh, certain of your own policies, these types of features and tools enable you to meet those, meet those requirements. And then the other thing is, is that we, we try to continuously innovate when it comes to security. And one of the things that we do is we share that innovation with the broader community. And I'll talk about a couple of those things in a few minutes. I'll talk about that. Um, so let's talk about, let's talk about some actual examples of this. So I already talked about how we uh, are concerned about um, a hard network perimeter and a soft interior. And so one of the principles that we think about is that we put the access control and security as close to the resource 
that needs to be under control as possible. And so let me talk about some of the characteristics of that. One, we think about um, how we use things. So at Google, everybody has a unique identity. Um, and you use that unique identity to perform all the, uh, all the IT functions that you need to. Um, we, don't, we don't share identities and we don't have, a, we don't have uh, capabilities where we're, we're uh, well, we don't share identities so we know who's taking a particular activity. Those users are granted those privileges based upon their job function and the job that they need to get done. And we operate under a model of least privilege access. So if your job function doesn't require it, you're not going to have access to the resource. We also use physical two-factor authentication. Um, and we've made, uh, we've been involved heavily with the, uh, with the FIDO Alliance, and we've made sure that, uh, that that standard continues to be open, and we've made sure that our services support, the, uh, support those standards so that you can use uh, physical two-factor authentication. And as a public service announcement, if you're not using two -factor, physical two-factor authentication, please do. It dramatically reduces phishing as an exploit and a, and a threat. Um, from a deployment point of view, we've got a rigorous uh, software development and deployment process where we separate development from operations. And so we, um, we make sure that the uh, software that gets deployed as services into our infrastructure only comes out of the appropriate repository. The, uh, the binaries are digitally signed, so we can we understand the provenance of those. And we, we, we separate the duties of the personnel. So the development engineers are not installing application software into the infrastructure. And the development engineers are not updating the operating systems in the production infrastructure. We've got different groups of people to perform those activities under the appropriate controls. Um, in terms of application development at Google, um, so I talked about the security engineering team. One of the roles that they play is early in the life cycle of a product, they're involved in a development milestone called the security review. And what they're doing there is they're sitting down with the team as the team's doing their, doing their design, and they're helping point out good patterns for secure design. They're helping make sure that the team understands maybe there's a change in the way we've done a particular library for encryption or something like that. But they help support that team so that not everybody has to be a deep security expert. Later in the development, when the team's getting closer to launch, we'll convene another, another review. And what's going on there is that the security engineering team is doing a double check on the delivery of the software to make sure that the requirements stay in place. And you know, you develop software, your requirements change over time. You know, you can never, you can never write your software fast enough that something doesn't change, even if you just change your mind on how you want to implement something. And so in order to, in order to preserve that security profile that we've invested in, we do a double check. And if something's changed, we just make sure that it stays valid. Um, and and that just, that's been a practice for us that's, that's really helped out. The other thing is, is that our developers all uh, do peer review on the code. So before you check any code into the source code repository, you're, you're validating that with, with, uh, with another software engineer. And they're, they're looking for, of course, security issues, but they're looking for other types of things like code readability and, and things like that. But we have found that um, you know, having that kind of check and balance, um, you know, just helps us do the right kinds of things. It also is a tool that helps us train newer engineers in kind of the way that we do business, because it's typically the review is done by a more seasoned engineer, a little bit more experienced. Um, we also, uh, we also, in terms of in terms of our network capabilities, uh, on this infrastructure that I showed you earlier, we run one of the largest software design <coughs> networks. And because of that, we're able to do some really interesting things in terms of network isolation and being able to do purposefully defined networks to solve particular problems. And that provides an interesting feature for customers of cloud. Um, so when you set up a project in cloud platform, you're actually getting your own private software defined network. Um, and you have complete control over that. And so you can open it up and close it down, connect it to the services that you want. Uh, but you've got the complete the complete control of that, and it is your it is your private network, and we are encrypting the traffic that we transit around the networks. Um, so there's a couple of uh, techniques in there that are helping us provide another layer of defense. Um, our storage infrastructure um, is uh, is largely managed through a service layer. Um, so 
we're able to deliver the various services, uh, you know, SQL-based storage, NoSQL-based storage, blob storage. All of this relies on the same physical storage infrastructure, but the service layer enables us to realize this in the different ways that developers want to take advantage of it and get the experience that's optimized for the particular application that they're trying to deliver. In addition to that, um, all, all data that's put into the storage, the various services on the storage infrastructure, is all encrypted. We, um, we also, in, in our operation, we've uh, we, we use a tailored version of Linux to run our, our server infrastructure. Um, we've tailored it in such a way that we, we've hardened it. And so what that means is that we've removed all the services that are not relevant to us running our operation. And, we, um, and so much like I was explaining that the software applications are, are uh, cryptographically signed, we do the same thing with the operating system so that we validate that we don't have, you know, post installation of an operating system, we don't have any drift in the configuration of it because we, we validated that. Um, and we do the same thing, uh, we do the same thing at boot time, is we're doing that validation and making sure that we're putting the appropriate operating system on there. And this enables, and because we because we do this and we've automated this, this will enables us to, uh, we install a new server in our infrastructure about every three seconds. And so that process is highly automated, and so the network kind of recognizes the server's in place, and it starts to provision it. And by using by using these automated processes with these checks and balances, and we're able to do that kind of expansion pretty rapidly. Um, and then, uh, from a hardware point of view, um, we we build uh, we build all of our own servers. We use uh, commercial off-the-shelf technology. Um, but let me let me talk about it, talk about this a little bit in terms of the hardware that we built. Um, in some situations, we do build our own silicon, and we are doing that for a couple reasons. One is we may want a particular acceleration or performance characteristic out of that hardware, or we may want to um, we may want to use it for a very specific activity that's not necessarily commercially available. Um, like I said, we build our own servers. We're one of the top five server manufacturers in the world. The servers that we manufacture are completely for our own use. They go into our data centers. They're used uh, for our purposes, um, and uh, we don't uh, we don't commercially sell these or make these available to everybody else. Um, we use uh, and, and obviously you know part of the reason that we're doing that is so that we're very efficient in our power usage. We're very efficient in our real estate usage in our data centers. And then the other thing is like hardening the operating system that I told you about. We do the same thing from a hardware point of view. So because we're not using uh, a commercial server that's designed to meet the needs of, of thousands of customers or even hundreds of customers, um, we're able to we're able to tailor the hardware and remove the components that aren't useful to us. And the uh, security benefit of that is that it reduces the, the the hardware the vulnerability surface of that hardware. <coughs> so it's, it gives us a situation where it's less likely for there to be a ghost in the machine. We've, um, and then from a, from a storage point of view, we use uh, commercially available disk. We understand that disks have a certain lifespan and have the potential to fail. So the hardware storage platform is built understanding that w with that kind of <coughs> design philosophy in mind. Um, and so we are able to, um, to amass all these disks. Um, they're used in a manner that could be compared to a large read array, if you're familiar with that. But when you get to the physical storage on the disk, we're only putting a stripe of the data. And so the, to compile a whole file requires that you read multiple disks at one time. This has largely been done for performance and efficiency, and also gives us the ability to make the storage very highly available. We wrote a paper a couple years ago called the, uh, the Google File System. Uh, I would encourage you to read it if you <coughs> haven't. It's it's uh, it's actually a really nice paper, and there's and it's and it explains uh, a lot of the philosophy behind that. But the, there's a couple benefits. Uh, there's a couple of security benefits that we get from that. One is the hardware, the disk vendors all provide hardware encryption. We take advantage of that um, because the disk only has a bit of the data. If a disk were for some reason to fall into an adversary's hands, they don't have enough information to reconstitute anything. 
it's, it's going to be, um, it's just encrypted fits. Um, and we, um, but then the service layer on top, which realizes the different flavors of storage that we provide to our customers, also provides encryption. And so we, we, have, the, we have the added benefit of, of not just the hardware encryption, but the software encryption that's encrypted on a per customer basis. And, that's, um, and that is available to customers without them doing any work above and beyond just developing applications in the cloud. Um, I showed you the picture of the network that we've built. Uh, it's very high performance. Um, because of the software definition, it gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, and we're, we, we've built this really high performance network around the globe. Um, and we build and manage all of our own data centers. Um, and in fact, um, this year, uh, just kind of an interesting tidbit, um, we, uh, actually it wasn't just this year, but we're completely carbon neutral in terms of our data center operations. Um, and in fact, the team that does the actual design and builds of the data centers, they have a really interesting uh, kind of principle where every time they build a new data center, they're just voraciously uh, absorbing the lessons learned and, and doing better each time, making them more energy efficient, putting more servers in the same, in the same physical footprint, and, and doing all kinds of interesting things like that. Um, it's, a, it's a hardware engineer, mechanical engineering dream to get to work on some of these interesting things that they do. Um, so I talked about us building some uh, specific hardware. This is, uh, this is a picture of a piece of, of silicon we built that's called a Titan chip. Um, and what this is, is this is a, um, uh, a cryptographic chip that enables us to establish a hardware of trust. And so what we're able to do with this is we're able to use this to ensure that the products that we're getting through our supply chain are the actual products that, that we ordered and nobody's, nobody's changed our design as, as it's come from, as it came off of the assembly line we take and put it into our data centers. Uh, we announced this about a year ago, um, and so uh, this, is, this is getting widespread deployment throughout our fleet. Um, one of the things, one of the other things is, so, so I've given you a whole lot that talks about our, our physical security and our, um, you know, our hardware and things like that. Um, we also, um, this, we have a, a lot of um, thought into the processes and change management of running our operation. And we lay out a lot of policies and procedures that we use to follow. And we, we err on the side of automation where we can where we can automate things to improve tasks. And our site reliability engineers, who are our operations engineers, have a battle cry of uh, reduce or eliminate toil. So if they have to do anything more than three times, they, they're, they're writing the scripts to fix that because it's just, not, it's just not worth their time. But in order to deal, to do business commercially, one of the other things that we do is we run a global compliance program where we certify against different standards and attestations. We do this for a couple of reasons. One is, is that customers want to know. They want to know this story and they want to validate this and they don't want to just take us at our word for it. So we get third parties to attest to this. We make this information available to customers and prospects as they need it to help them be comfortable with the fact that Google's platform is in fact safe and secure. And this just gives us the opportunity to have a third party say that. The second thing that we're doing here is, is that we have a lot of folks, you know, our customers are involved in all different types of businesses. <coughs> and the different types of businesses have different but similar views on this. And so one of the things that we've tried to do is be as broad in, in acceptance of these standards and trying to satisfy these standards so that we can satisfy a broad class of customers. And so this is, this is a snapshot of the work that we've done there. This program continues to grow, um, and so if you see me a year from now, the team's hard at work on this, and, I'm, and the, the number of badges on here will probably be double. Yes? I have to ask a question about that. Me using Google Cloud, when I'm like being audited by somebody, and I want to actually show him that by using Google Cloud, I'm up for all of these standards, where I can actually take a legal document and send it off to them and say that, like, this is where I'm putting my data, this is why I'm protected, or I'm up to some kind of level of certification. Because I couldn't find that in the documentation. 
So that's a really interesting question. So it's it's twofold. Um, one is is that um, compliance is a is a is a kind of a funny beast. It's not an inherited characteristic, um, but it does solve part of your problem. So let's take the case of, of PCI DSS. So PCI DSS is the payment card industry's data security standard. And so if you handle credit card information, uh, you have to follow these standards. Um, and so we do an annual assessment. We bring in an auditor that writes a, a report on this and then issues what is called an attestation of compliance. Um, and so one thing that we do for our PCI customers is that we make available the attestation of compliance. They have to ask for it, but that can be used as a piece of evidence for their auditor to say, hey, um, we've, we've met this part, now you've got to look at my piece. The other part of PCI, and we have this published on the website, we have a document that's called the Shared Responsibility Matrix. And that's actually a control sheet, and it's actually 20 plus pages, there's quite a bit in there. But it goes through all the controls that PCI requires to meet their standard, and it explains who's responsible for each control. So in some situations, Google's responsible for the control, and in other situations, you, the application developer, are responsible for the control. So we try to, 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 to so to get to the punchline on your question, we try to make <coughs> as much of this information as, avail avail as possible available on the website. Um, okay cloud.google.com slash security slash compliance is where, is where we make these things available. In the situation where there's something that we're claiming there's uh, compliance to and there's not necessarily supporting documentation, um, account manager maybe. ask your account manager. You can also generate a support ticket. Um, but uh, we have, there is some documentation that we will make available to customers but we distribute it under an NDA uh, because some of the information is just sensitive. Um, but it's, there's a little bit of process in place. It's not onerous, but we do have a little bit of formality. So there actually sure. reach out to yes. somebody and actually get that? I start with your account manager. Yeah. They, yeah. All, they, all, they all do know how to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just want to reply. Um, wow. I had a similar issue last year. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I was, um, the process, so uh, on the side, there are like high-level uh, approval that you can use, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't absorb you from doing both that on your own. System. Of course, of course. So uh, for infrastructure side, it's, uh, you, you can use that and and forward it to whoever do your tests. But so it's enough from that side. But from your application side, from your system for PCI, you have different guidelines. Mm -hmm. So it's two aspects. Yeah, I agree. A lot of these regulations are applied by the things that I'm using as third parties. They have to be secure for me to start being secure myself. So because of that, I need that like legal yeah. document for the first page. So, yeah. yeah. so on the side, there is like a page that do a high level summary. Um, and you can see that we use it like for storage and things like that that are not PCI. Um, uh, I think for storage, for infrastructure, for network. You, you really have, you actually have like Checklist. high level like yeah exactly mm -hmm. like you can see the, the issue and it's like a PDF for two pages. Mm -hmm. it's, if if that was in a high level, that's mm -hmm. that's like very simple procedure. Yeah, but if there's but if there's not information that's there, ask your like ask that. your account rep. Um, and the, the other thing that the other thing that the team does that manages this program is they're constantly seeking feedback. And the other thing they're trying to do is they're trying to make more and more of the information self-service. Um, there's just, you know, some of it. Some of it has a level of sensitivity that you just can't post it publicly. Um, and so, they're, but they're they're always looking at ways to to kind of get around that. Um, so, you know, give your account manager feedback. Hey, this would really help us out because we do listen to customers, and and you know that's important to us because anything anything that's heavyweight for you to do just increases the friction on your business. Oh. I guess we gotta put another coin in the slot. Yeah. Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yeah. That's it's gonna it's it's look like you're starting a handle. Yeah you have to connect with the Google account and then have to
Well, that's what I get for bragging about. I told you, we jinxed it. <laughs> So let me talk about a couple of the features that, that are kind of interesting in, uh, in the cloud platform. So I was talking about how we encrypt data at rest and data in transit in, in, in Google. Um, but one of the other things that we've done is in terms of listening to our customers, we've gotten feedback that they'd love to have more control over encryption. So uh, a couple things that we've done is one, uh, a year, about a year ago, um, we uh, launched a service that's called Customer Supply Encryption Keys. And so this gives customers the opportunity to um, use an API, provide encryption keys to Google <coughs> to uh, encrypt uh, data at rest and um, in some of the services. Um, and those keys, while they're in the cloud, are ephemeral. Um, so we use them to do encryption and decryption automatically on behalf of the customer. And then when the application stops running, the keys go away and um, and they have to be resupplied by the customer to restart the application and make sure that it's working properly. Further on to that, what we actually, what the, what I think is actually a more interesting service that we that we're providing is we're providing cloud key management. And so what we've done here is we've taken our native key management service, which we've built over many years, that enables us to do all the automatic encryption and handles all the policies and procedures um, automatically, and we've actually added features to that and it opened it up to customers. So what you can do with the key management service is you can actually control the policies around around your key management. So if you have uh, if you have a, a time to live policy on your keys that um, you um, that's shorter than what we provide in the native service, this gives you the opportunity to implement that policy. If you have some sort of event that causes you to uh, gives you the need to rotate your keys, this gives you the ability to do that. And so that's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a very highly scalable service, it's pretty straightforward to use, um, and it enables, it enables us to uh, more readily meet customers' requirements in this space. And over, over the next year or so, you'll also start to see those services get even richer in terms of uh, broader coverage on the platform and other things that customers will be able to do in conjunction with that. This is really interesting, although the slide seems to be quite washed out here. Um, but this is, uh, we're, we're about to make this generally available. This is the Data Loss Prevention API. And what this is, is this is an API that gives you the ability to um, scan text for uh, personally identifiable information and other sensitive information. And it also provides some capabilities where you could actually redact that information or anonymize it, depending upon the use case that you have. And so, uh, the and so where we have customers who've been involved in the early access using this is they're doing things like um, using this to survey uh, documents that they've put into into cloud storage, so that they can they can do a risk assessment. Do I have um, documents that have information in it that maybe need to be under tighter control? Or maybe these documents shouldn't be here, maybe I need to move them to another place because I want to avoid having a privacy issue. The, the, the really, and one of the fun things about this from our point of view is that a lot of the capability in here is based upon our years of searching and indexing the web and learning how to spot particular bits of information and documents to make it easy for people to search. And so what we've done with the, we've, we've taken those years of learning and packaged them up into the API so customers can take advantage of this. And then we've also applied machine learning to this that's actually made the models more robust and the accuracy much higher. Um, and and it's, a, it's a REST API, you put information into it, it gives you JSON feedback, and it, uh, and it's you know it's really straightforward to use uh, from a web application development point of view. Yes, sir. Uh, the end result is a GDPR compliant. Um, you could use this as a tool to help you um, perform some of your compliance activities. Um, so you know, for example, one thing 
that you need to take into consideration with GDPR is you need to know where you've, you've stored uh, PII. Um, and so maybe you've, maybe you've written an application that is, uh, let's say you've written a, uh, maybe you have a, an application where you have users that subscribe to it. And so they fill out information, they give you some personal information about themselves that helps you identify the account. Well, the account, the information in the account might be, I don't know, maybe it's videos, maybe, you know, maybe it's a Bitcoin wallet or something like that. Well, that information in and of itself is not concerning from a privacy point of view. But the personally identifiable information about the user's name or maybe where they live or some other characteristics like that, that is personally identifiable information. And that's the information that needs to be, uh, you know, needs to be considered sensitive that you need to protect under those rules. Well, maybe you've architected your application so that the, the content is in one database and the personally identifiable information is in another, another database. But maybe, maybe the developer made a mistake and they're actually putting the, the personally identifiable information in with the content. And so you could, you could do a couple things. One is, is that once you realize that you have this bug, you could go and take a look and see you know, where you would need to go and kind of eliminate this data once you fix the bug so you're not creating the problem anymore. So that's an example of how you might use it. Um, you might use it in a case where you have a bunch of stuff stored and you don't even know what it is. So let's, let's, let's do a scan of it and, and take a look and see what, see what I get back. And so these are just some different types of things. Another place where this is used is, this is actually built into uh, the G Suite product um, into, into Gmail. And so as a, an enterprise user of G Suite, you can actually go in and set rules that take advantage of this technology that might uh, block an email from leaving your enterprise because it might have information in it that, it that the user should not be sending out. And so this is, these are the types of use cases where this, where this comes in handy. Um, we, we actually, uh, it really, it was kind of fun. They did a demo for, uh, for we do a, a show in San Francisco um, where we get all the cloud customers come and meet, meet up with us. It's called Next. Um, and when we demonstrated this at Next, um, what they did was they actually took a credit card and held it under a camera. And then what showed up on the screen was the redacted version of that. So it was able to spot the numbers and then it was able to, we wrote a little application that blurred it out. So those are types of things that people are using it for. Um, another use case where we've seen, we've seen this uh, generate some real interest is, um, and this is actually a really great GDPR case, is that you might have a customer service rep that helps support your application or your service. And they need enough information to be able to handle the customer when they call on the phone or send an email in. But you can use, this tool can be used to actually make sure that you're not displaying the protected information in the customer service rep's user interface. Because it's not relevant to what the job they need to do, but the record might be attached. And this, enable, this can enable you, enable you to do kind of role-based access control where particular roles, the appropriate ones, don't have that control in place but just the general customer service rep does have that control and the API enables you to enforce that. Um, and then uh, I talked a few minutes ago about innovation. Um, and so a few things that we've done, and these are contributions that we've made to the overall community, um, are, uh, are innovations like um, TLS for email encryption. <coughs> so a couple years ago, we were looking at the internet traffic, the email traffic coming in out of Gmail, and a large portion of it was was not encrypted. Um, and there's a standard for encryption. So we started turning that on at, at, at um, for Gmail, and started encrypting those SMTP connections. And through a lot of effort and campaigning and uh, you know, kind of negotiating, we got most of the major internet email providers to do the same kind of thing. And we've done the same thing with HTTPS. So Google searches are now under HTTPS. And it's not a ton of encryption, but it saves you from sitting in a, in a cafe and having somebody sniff, you know, your email as you're transmitting it to, to Gmail. 
Uh, and we believe that these types of things are good for everybody. And so we've done them with standards and we encourage other people to do them. Uh, safe browsing is another pretty significant innovation. So we index, we crawl and index the web a lot because that's, well, that's how search works and that's, that's what we need to do to help people out. Well, as a result of that, one of the things that we've developed over time is when we see a new website, a new URL, um, we actually take a look at it. And in some situations, there might be malware there. There might be something bad there. And so safe browsing is our catalog of, the, of bad things. And how, how this is interesting is that this is then fed into, this is fed to the Chrome browser. And so the Chrome browser will, as you're surfing the internet, um, if you encounter a site that safe browsing is seen and deemed not safe, the Chrome browser will tell you that. Hey, if you go to this website, it could cause trouble for you. We don't stop the user from going, but we do warn them. And they have to take an explicit action. And we've also made this available. It's available as an API. So the Mozilla browser takes advantage of it. The Safari browser takes advantage of it. Um, there's companies that do web filtering, um, and they, they also take advantage of it to actually correlate stuff that they're building into their proxies and also um, augment uh, information that they don't have. Um, security keys, I talked about that a few minutes ago, um, but this is our work around uh, supporting the FIDO Alliance and really uh, emphasizing physical two-factor <coughs> authentication. We also are huge contributors to open source software. Um, you know, some of the big things at a cloud level, not necessarily security, are, uh, is, is Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes is a big thing. Actually, with respect to that, we've also made Istio available. And Istio gives you a security framework that you can use around Q Kubernetes. Um, and it's really interesting because in open sourcing both of these things, we've had large contributions from the community that make it a better product for everybody to use. <coughs> we've also open sourced some other internal security tools that we've used. Uh, there's a there's a tool called Firing Range that you can get on GitHub. What it does is it, it simulates mass amounts of traffic and unusual traffic that you can put against web-based applications and help you find vulnerabilities. So it's a fuzzing tool. Right. Um, there's another tool called GUR, which enables you to generate some forensics information off of virtual GUR. machines. GUR, G-R-R, GUR. Um, and then, of course, uh, you may or may not be familiar with our Vulnerability Rewards Program, uh, but we pay bounties on bugs. And this has been a really interesting program for us. It's paid out millions of dollars over, over its lifespan. It's helped us find some really interesting problems that we, we, we didn't discover in a negative way. So it wasn't something bad was happening. It was somebody who was doing some research and found that and reported it to us. It's also been an interesting tool in terms of us keeping close, closely uh, in touch with the, um, the security research community. And, and on a couple of occasions, it's, uh, it's found us a couple of employees, um, some really interesting people. For uh, safe browsing, good question. For sure. safe browsing, do you use an internal tool to determine if the page contains a malware, or do you use, let's say, reputation services already out there? Um, it's largely based upon our own infrastructure that we've built. Um, but for example, you've maybe heard of Virus Total. Yeah, okay. um, so virus toll is gives us the capability to score new things that we've seen uh, with commercial antivirus engines. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing that we use. Uh, the other things that we do, we do things like sandboxing stuff, so that we can see what happens when it when it runs. Um, so you know sometimes uh, when you hit a website, and if you're coming from you know a particular operating system that website has software on it that's going to try to do nasty things to your layer. Like, let's say you don't sandbox every new URL that you determine. Uh, we might. It, it would just kind of depend upon what the threat we're looking at is. Um, but, you know, keep in mind, because we're constantly indexing, it's an incremental thing for us. It's not all at once. Right. Um, but it does become a scalability issue. Can so, I another, like, reporting thing? Sure. And about phishing sites. Yes. What we want to actually report, and a friend of mine had that problem. The response time is really like with high latency in that matter, like in a matter of like two days sometimes. Ah, interesting. So who can people actually can contact to 
to make things faster because it was a real phishing website similar to his that somebody ramped up with uh, some kind of like similar URL and he was trying to like actively fish. Uh, he saw that uh, data of his customers. So let me let me let me do a little bit of homework on okay. that and find out that the 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 lag on that doesn't sound quite right and so let me look into that no and, and see what I can come because back he with actually asked me and I was like okay no I that's a know. fair question and, and that should be you know the, the response time on that should be uh, pretty quick um, so let me let no me problem. let me double check on that um, project zero um, so project zero's investment that we made it's a team of researchers that are um, they're really smart <laughs> really smart they break things um, but the but the other thing that they do is they are committed to reducing or eliminating the black market in zero-day vulnerabilities. And so vulnerabilities are discovered and there's coordination with the responsible vendor on vulnerabilities and it results in a, in a coordinated uh, disclosure process. But, oh, yeah, I'm, okay, <laughs> one more slide. Um, so I was asked about GDPR. Um, so Demi sent me a note a couple days ago and said, hey, can you also say something about GDPR? So let me, let me talk, uh, let me just give you a little bit of uh, uh, Google background on GDPR. So uh, in 2015, you may or may not have remembered, uh, this is going to get a little nerdy from a legal point of view. Uh, there's a gentleman named Max Schrems, uh, he's Austrian, and he's a lawyer, or he was a law student at the time, I think, and he sued Facebook. Uh, because he said Facebook wasn't keeping his information private and as a European citizen he was entitled to that. Um, the European Court of Justice agreed with him and it was, it was amazing because the decision got handed down really quickly. It was uh, a lot of uh, lawyers that I know were really impressed with the speed of that um, because it was unusual. They had never seen that from the European Court of Justice. Um, and they have their theories on why, why it was quick. Um, but, uh, and so the end result of that, that case, um, and Max Schrems winning that case, is that it nullified uh, a, a, a treaty between the United States and the European Union called Safe Harbor. And Safe Harbor was a mechanism that US companies were using to be able to service European customers and be deemed adequate under the privacy regime. Uh, so as a result of that, there was no mechanism, and so there was a period of time where people were out of compliance. So at Google, one of the things that we did right when that happened is that we made a mechanism available to our customers that's known as model contract clauses. And so model contract clauses are an additional method of privacy control that's adequate for the European Union. They're also called standard contract clauses, so you may hear them by that term. Um, they are concrete, they're specified, you don't change the model clauses, you just agree to them or don't agree to them. But in order to understand how we implement the model contract clauses and how they work, we produced a document that's called the Data Processing and Security Terms. And this is actually an agreement that the customers enter into with us. And this explains how the privacy works. It explains uh, the customer's rights under this, um, which are dictated by regulations in Europe. And then it also provides uh, quite a bit of information about how we secure the cloud and secure customers' information and stuff like that. We, we, we made this available so that our customers couldn't comply with this. At the same time we made it available, we went through a process which is known as the common opinion. And what this is, is that we approached the Article 29 Working Group, which is the privacy working group in the European Union. It's a committee that's made up of the European data privacy agencies. And we submitted this information to them. Uh, and they reviewed it and came back and gave us an opinion that this information was adequate to meet the privacy requirements of the customers under European privacy regulations. So well, this is, this took this was uh, the interesting thing about it is is that it was supposed to be a fairly straightforward process, and it took us 2016 to accomplish that. Um, and at the same time that we were working on that, the European Union was in the process of passing the General Data Protection Regulations. <coughs> And so this is the law under which they're protecting European citizens' privacy. Um, and this applies to anybody in the world who is serving European consumers 
you're, you're, you're subject to this law. And so as a result of that, um, there was a, there's a couple things that, that, that we had. There was some stuff we had going on and some things that we did. One of the things that we had going on was uh, we, we also, I talked to you about compliance earlier. Well, one of the standards that we took a hard look at and we decided to certify against was ISO 27018. And if you're not familiar with ISO 27018, it is specifically a privacy standard. And it has controls in place for privately handling end user data. And so it sounds a lot like GDPR. Well, the actual controls that are in ISO 27018 are almost a mirror image of the controls that are listed in GDPR. And the reason for that is that the organization that authored that portion of GDPR was also the primary author of the ISO 27018 standard. So by embarking on that work, we had already laid the foundation to meet the technical requirements of GDPR. Uh, and so that gave us a, a good level of confidence going into that. The other thing that we did is there are some contractual things that need to change for consumers of services like Google Cloud, like other clouds. And that's realized in a new edition of the data processing and security terms. So in November of last year, we launched a new version of the data processing and security terms, which was version 1.2. And what that did was basically uh, said that GDPR is coming and you're, we're, we're laying the groundwork for, for our relationship to fall under, to be compliant with GDPR. And in May of 2018, when GDPR comes into enforcement, the, you, we are going to switch you to a set of terms that is known as the DPS. <coughs> DPST version 2. And so what we were doing there was we were making sure that our customers had enough lead time to review these documents and be able to accept them and be comfortable with them. So it's the version 2 supports the GDPR requirements. The version 1 tells you that this is coming and gives us enough time so that all the customers have time to review it. So actually both of those documents were published at exactly the same time. It's just the version 2 comes into effect when GDPR comes into effect in May. So it was, it, was, it was a way that we could get this information out early and to everybody and give everybody enough time to consume it and ask questions and stuff like that. So far, it seems to be working pretty well in terms of, um, in terms of getting this in front of customers so that they can accept it and take advantage of it. Um, but, um, you know, uh, GDPR is generating a lot of excitement. What you should, based upon my, you know, talk bit there, what you should be able to take away from that is that you should feel comfortable in the fact that if you're building services on Google Cloud, and you fall under GDPR. We've done the foundational work so that you can build upon that and meet those requirements <coughs> and, not, and not be concerned about getting yourself into trouble. You do still need to understand GDPR, and I would encourage you to educate yourself on it, um, but it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward, and at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's really about making sure that you're handling people's information with care and, and respect, and and and, uh, and and I think it's there's a lot of lottery, but what they're getting at is actually reasonable, I think. So thank you. Yes. No, those those documents are all on the website. Um, so if. Uh, if you go to the Terms of Service page, um, which is uh, cloud.google.com slash terms, uh, there's links on the left-hand side of the page that have the various documents. So you can go to the data processing and security terms, and it has both versions there, so you can see it. Sure. Yes? Um, so you're Any other questions? questions? Awesome. Thank questions you very much. Well, thank you. 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 Well
the GFS is like, like yeah, yeah ba like back then. And, and it makes them, uh, so, um, well, the white paper from 2000 <coughs> um, actually should talk about encrypting data graphs. Okay. It's 15 uh, pages. <laughs> no, oh, the GFS paper. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, the GFS paper doesn't talk about that. It's talking <laughs> about the uh, about the, the technical architecture. Uh, they're, they're not so, they're not as worried about that. Wait. There is another paper at the cloud security website. Um, there Actually, there's two papers. There's an encryption of rest and an encryption of transit mm -hmm. that tells you all the mechanics of how it works and stuff. So if you really want to learn the inside sure of it. Yeah. <laughs> the GFS thing, HDFS one was based on that. So this was the purpose of that white paper, basically, I think. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> A uh, couple questions. One, um, there's always sort of a, a little bit of a tug of war between customer privacy um, and the customer's data. And if such data causes an outage or if customer behavior causes an outage of some kind, uh, getting still something to SRE and ops teams that they can use to work with to try and identify what is causing the outage. Um, and there's, there's always a, a balance of some kind that some kind of tug of war between um, those two those two interests. So if you could talk about that. Sure. Um, so we so let me see the best. One. So one of the interesting things that we've 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 been working on for the past several years is the is ensuring that the fidelity of the services that we're delivering is, is quite high. And so we don't run into as many situations where we have uh, operational problems that are, that are caused by a customer's data. Um, and so the situations where we would, we would need to, we would need to stick our nose into customer's data are very, very few and far between. Um, there are some situations where it happens, but usually in that situation, uh, the customer's involved. There's a support ticket involved. The customer's providing permission for that access, um, and, and, it's, and it's a well thought out exercise. It's not something that's necessarily going on behind the scenes. We have customers, uh, I'll be honest with you, we have customers that are doing some amazing things on our platforms, and they're pushing edges of the platform in ways that we weren't expecting. Um, and so for our customers that are actually doing those kinds of things, there's a lot of times where we have a really good relationship with them because they're saying, hey, I need more performance here, and we're actually partnering with them. Uh, I mentioned Istio, the uh, open source security tool. That was done, actually done in partnership with Spotify. Um, and because uh, Spotify is an early large scale customer of Google Cloud, and they recognize some issues in terms of managing uh, some of the security controls and how they wanted to operate their service. And so we, we ended up partnering up with them and developing it, and it's open source uh, so that more people will take advantage of it and actually contribute to it. You get the name of it? It's called Istio. I -S -S A service smash on top of Kubernetes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Um, why? I also have a bit of a second question. Sure. Maybe esoteric in, in comparison. Um, a lot of the privacy controls we've been talking about are about your customers' actual data, make sure the customer's data is encrypted and rest and fight and kind of these other things. Uh, but I'm also wondering about customer metadata, in a sense, um, <coughs> threats that come from analyzing uh, not the data that the customer actually has, or the code that the customer actually has, but analyzing the customer's behavior. And um, I was trying to think up of, a, of an example when I was thinking of this question. You mentioned in the beginning um, the need for two-factor authentication for customers to be able to two-factor authentication. Um, so I guess maybe for me it's easier to, to try and imagine a situation where there could in theory be like a list of like customers, you know, maybe not really internally facing whatever, but a list of customers which have two-factor authentication enabled and a list of customers which do not. Um, and the list of customers which do not would be valuable to an attacker because it would say that, oh, these customers are easier to try and fish their employees or whatever have it. And so that something like that is also valuable and also uh, has to be secured. 
Oh, it, you, you raise a good point. Um, but if we if we take a look at kind of the you know the threat model there, yes, that becomes an interesting rich target. But it also, if you think about um, the business that we're trying to operate in, it doesn't do us any good for our customers to get compromised. I mean, we don't want no, that at the end of the day. Right. And so, and so we handle that type of information much like we would the customer's own data in terms that that would not be information that would be widely available to our employees. That would not be information that would be, you know, that would be information that would like live in our own systems, mm -hmm. which we protect and we provide that protection to our customers as well. And so, um, yeah, that would be a that would be a good target to get, but it, we would we would definitely um, it would it would definitely be a, a good challenge to get at it. Um, so um, I can't tell you that it's impossible, um, but but I I would assert that we would we would do so a I, good job. I, I guess to kind of that. to sharpen that question is sort of um, does your threat model of your um, of internal threats. At, at Google, Google employees, does it take into account um, employees being able to analyze like customer behavior patterns in production systems? It, it does. It does. And 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 you know, much like operating systems, you know, people who are doing that kind of work, it's specific to the work that they're doing. So the example of customers that might be using two-factor authentication and customers that are not using two-factor authentication, where that would become interesting to, to Google and a particular employee at Google is um, the gentleman or the team that wants to make sure that the customers are using that. And so that kind of thing, what that would do, that would prompt the program to kick off to, in, to help those people start to take advantage of that technology. Because obviously we'd want to make that list get smaller and smaller, and so it would be the appropriate people that would handle that information to help the customer be in a better position. Okay, sorry, but yes, thank you very very much, Matthew. Sure.